And we are live. Welcome to Totally Unscripted. Wow. We have got a bumper show. Uh, so we're not going to spend too much time, I think. You should buy one after one episode, no, us all, <laughs> as, as hosts. But um, it was something we actually talked about in our kind of recap show. We talked a lot about generative AI. And it's a topic I think it, it's worth spending more time on. So, um, and Is I think we've got. Is there anything else to talk about? I don't think so right now. And um, I'm super just looking at the content that's coming out today in terms of what's possible, particularly what's possible in the Google workspace. I think um, it's going to be a topic we're going to revisit quite often. But I think it's worth saying, Charles, as well, that you know, it, it might be the buzzword of 23, 24, but this is an area that Google has been working on for a long time. If you go back through the totally unscripted archive, you'll see things like API.ai, which became Dialogflow. You'll see Document AI. So I don't know, Charles, if you just want to kind of paint the picture, set the scene for us as part of this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm just going to flip this slide up. And you've probably seen this, or hopefully you've seen this when we talk about where Workspace is with using AI inside the product. You know, as you mentioned, Martin, it's not new, right? It's been around for nearly a decade. And you see a lot of these features you know, neatly slipped in with the way users are working throughout, whether it's you know helping them with you know um, smart compose or smart reply or creating charts for them or file suggestions or things you recently learned, all these great things that actually help folks really work directly with the products. And so that's really super neat. But I think what I think the highlight that we see now, this inflection point we're at, is developers can start to use the technology to build solutions that aren't necessarily built in workspace. They're built with, around, and for workspace that you can create customized solutions on. So I think that's kind of the, the evolution or the revolution, if you will, uh, of the, the way it's really changed. And so um, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big change. It really is. So what I'd like to do, though, is if we can quickly get to our guests, because we got some great guests. Um, so these folks, hopefully you already know, but we'll bring them up and introduce them as well. So Martin, if you want to bring them on, I think that would be super awesome. And in no particular order, as they do stumble in here, uh, first of all, Alan Persenberg, who is a GDE. He's actually a GDE for not just Google Workspace, which is how I met him, um, but also he is a machine learning and has also been around, if you can tell. He's got his, his signature Google Glass model on. Um, a lot of interesting things that I love to ask Alan. My favorite thing about Alan was when I met you, Alan, we were at a GE Global Summit, and I was at lunch, and this guy walks up to me with a Google Glass on, and he goes, do you want to see me talk and edit a spreadsheet at the same time? <laughs> and I went, oh, yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, I do. I remember you had a, a, a I don't know if it was a product or a solution you called Voto Drive that you were – Again, years ago, actually able to talk mm -hmm. and actually use you know machine learning with voice to actually update spreadsheets. So we'll talk more about that in a second. But obviously, Alan, you're doing a ton of things these days. Um, what else is going on with you, Alan? Uh, just as you say, doing a ton of things these days. Uh, you know, as part of my day job, work for a consulting company and trying to help clients understand, you know, what is this machine learning thing and what can they do with it? How does it fit into what they do on a daily basis. And that that's kind of where I take uh, my approach from. And, and as you just popped up, uh, I have a podcast uh, called Two Voice Devs, where uh, my partner and I uh, started talking about how you know to develop for things like Google Assistant. And now we're talking about you know what is what uh, what is this AI, machine learning, large language mm -hmm. model, all of this stuff. How do we as developers use it for the stuff that we're already do doing? Awesome, awesome. And so also joining us, we we're super fortunate today to have a couple of Googlers who actually have done a lot around AI, uh, Donato and Mohammed. Uh, they actually spoke together next and did a great presentation on using AI with Google Workspace. So we'll get onto that in a little bit. Uh, but first, Donato Melli uh, is a go-to-market program solution engineer. Great title, long title. Um, what I know you for is you build really cool solutions using AI. But Donato, tell us a little more about yourself. Thank you, Charles, and thank you, everybody. Uh, 
glad to be here today. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm Donato working the go to marketing for Workspace. Basically, my job is to help our customers to understand what uh, they can do with Workspace and how Workspace and AI can help them solve some of their business problems. So it's definitely a very busy period right now, uh, talking with a lot of customers, a lot of interest about AI and uh, how that matches with Workspace. So this is definitely a great topic today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And at the bottom of the Brady Bunch uh, little or Hollywood Squares little thing we've got going on, uh, Mahalat Alansari. Mohammed is actually on my team. So thank you, Mohammed, for taking some time out. He's a developer advocate and very neat role where he focuses on helping partners uh, be more successful with workspace as a platform. Mohammed, what have I missed? Uh, nothing, Charles. You know, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, but exactly what you said, I work with some of our key and strategic partners to help unblock their integrations with Workspace. It's been quite exciting working with some GNAI partners, you know, working on chat, uh, meet, and some of the more interesting integrations that we have uh, lined up. So looking forward. Awesome, awesome. So one of the things I think for the show, this episode, and I think we're going to have some more episodes on AI, I think it's really the way there's kind of, again, this merging of where workspace and AI come together. The neat thing I always like to point out is workspace really hasn't fundamentally changed. As we mentioned, there's a lot of AI in the product. However, you know, we were kind of ready to connect, you know, we've got the interfaces, we've got the users, we've got the content, connect these solutions with capable models on the back end to do interesting things with. And so I like to think that Workspace was, was kind of ready to do this. I think what has changed, of course, is AI. And Alan, you made a great quote uh, in one of your episodes on your podcast. Um, you know, you used to use keywords for search. Now you have conversations instead. What now about AI excites you as a expert in machine learning at this convergence between the two technologies? I think what excites me the most about it is that uh, the models that we have access to now are very democratized. So it used to be two years ago, even, if you wanted to use AI or machine learning or any of these things, you needed to be a machine learning engineer. You needed to know how to do tuning. You needed to know a lot of stuff. Um, you needed to build your own model. You, you know, there was a lot that needed to be done. And now we have an API and you send text to the API and you get text back. And that's that's so much more in the realm of, yeah, exactly, Alice. It's now so much more in the realm of what every developer can do. I don't need to teach you complicated math. I don't need to teach you weightings. I don't need to teach you anything. All I need to teach you is how to write some text in the language of your, in the, the human language of your choice. And you can integrate it with your products. And that's why it excites me so much to see it um, as part of Workspace, is that now we as developers, and I'm very much a developer, can now take these models and take the APIs that are available through Workspace and tie them together and put them in with my, my business logic and my business flows. And all of that now comes together in this, this unified place. And that's just amazing to me that, that machine learning is now just another tool in my tool belt and lets me do some amazing things. I think that's it's a really good point in terms of, you know, you're just sending text. So if you can call a REST API, you're, you're pretty much, you know, most of the way there, there's a lot more that you can do in terms of uh, how you work and use those models. But I always, you know, kind of my, ramp onto this was Dialogflow, which I think is still a great product, but you still had to do the setup. You had to identify your intents, you, your fallback phrases, all this. And now I can just hit an API with, as you say, a text payload, and I'm get, getting something back that um, is able to make sense of what I've put in. So I think that's uh, you know, where it's very different to, compared to where it was a couple of years ago. So Alice, you had a little dissent and I saw you itching to talk. And so I want to say, what, what, <laughs> what, what, was, your, what was your thinking? Uh, you know, I feel like, you know, Google Docs initially was obviously uh, a call to Word, if I can say that. But recently, they've really been really embracing the collaboration and the offline piece. 
using Google Docs is and the features that have been coming out, you know, with the smart chips are not about printing. And so I think that is a fundamental shift. So that was my disagreement. Gotcha. Well, that's fair. Um, not to take us off that track, but I would really actually like to hear uh, Donato's take on the, basically the same question that we asked Alan. I mean, there are a lot of enterprise customers and you have, you know, firsthand experience with them. What do you hear that excites them about AI with workspace specifically? And are you seeing any trends and signals that you could share with us? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Kara. This is actually a very, uh, a very good question in terms of in terms of what enterprise can do with this. So I think that there is an, an uh, untapped opportunity for AI in workspace because so a AI as this came game changing uh, paradigm of uh, interacting with data. So there are two main things that I would say. Uh, so AI makes um, things like unstructured documents now uh, very important. So before, if your data was in database, that was gold. If you had a, a data that was unstructured, that was almost uh, useless. Now AI is reverting the concept. So now if you have uh, data unstructured in a document, that became gold because you can extract value way easily with, with AI. It's a paradigm shift. While if you have it in a database, now it becomes a little bit more tricky to use AI to extract data from it. So uh, the, the table is, is shifting. So um, workspace, I think, is perfectly positioned in this because AI is also useless without data. And workspace is, uh, a, a, say a, a gold mine of data. So you have, you can use AI. You don't need to import things, import information, import context. You can use AI in the place where all your information are, and you can use that in a way to extract value with a minimum change of your habits. So without additional overheads of I need to take my data and move it into another container, right? So that's where I see. Uh, AI in workspace being disruptive. And now, of course, Google approaches actually, I think is is great because it's giving you a lot of toolboxes, a, a, a toolbox of things you can use to to do things. So there is, you can use Duet out of the box to do a lot of mm -hmm. things already. Um, but then for uh, the specific situations that are only special to you and your company and your process, you can always take um, AppScript and Vertex and customize very quickly uh, a process that talks about your way of working. So I think I think all these things together are opening the doors to huge opportunities. So there is a lot of hype in the in the in the realm of AI and enterprise. So I think we need to do a good job of uh, educating about what's actually possible between what's magical thinking. Uh, but beyond that, I think there is there are untapped opportunities of uh, using AI in the context context of a collaboration platform like Workspace. Awesome. Uh, Mohammed, why don't we bring you in on a similar same question? As we know, partners are normally technology leaders. They do things quickly. They find great new innovations. What are you seeing that partners are doing specifically in terms of this? Um, do you have any examples or do you have any use cases that you, you see that are magical? Yeah, thanks for the question, Charles. I think, you know, as we talk to partners now, everybody wants to do something that, you know, with Gen AI, whether they have their own capabilities that exist on their own website or their own product, or whether they want to do something with workspace that includes Gen AI. And, you know, last year in 2023, September or so, I guess, we announced that we will be bringing Duet AI extensions at one point in the future. And this will allow you to build extensions that coexist with the wet and you know users can simply enable those within our um, you know Google workspace products but that's not there today and when I talk to partners I encourage them to use what exists today and what exists today a number of different integration options including you know Google workspace add-ons the editor add-on framework uh, chat apps and you know some more uh, that they can actually use to build stuff. Um, two of the Gen AI partners for example that I spoke to Jasper AI and typeface have built Editor add-ons. Now, editor add-ons can be looked at at the you know uh, older brother of add-ons framework, you know, but it allows you to embed your own uh, UI, HTML, and iframes within Workspace, and that works really well for partners who quickly iterate on their UI. They don't have time to like learn a new framework and continue to build and iterate. So, I'm seeing some success 
Um, you can also look at our Google Workspace Marketplace, where we've added you know, the intelligent app category. And if you go there, you will find tons of apps that uses AI. So whether it's the users, whether it's the partners or the customers, everybody is looking to incorporate Gen AI in their workflows and figure out how to make it happen, how to make use of it. I apologize for putting that banner over your face. <laughs> rude. <laughs> Just rude. Jamal, to the bottom. Put my family up. You got the basement segment of uh, <laughs> uh, it's all in order when you join. So do apologize for that, but it looked great. Uh, real quick, I think I, I wanted to switch gears for a second because uh, you mentioned, Muhammad, what partners are building. And I think there's still great opportunities. It's really a, still a frontier. Uh, but Damano, you also mentioned Duet. Um, so obviously Duet itself has created a lot of buzz. Obviously people are still exploring and playing with it. We're still adding an interesting features to it. Um, what has everybody seen the reaction to Duet? How are people using it? What do you think from a, uh, not really a developer standpoint, but more from a product standpoint, how is it, how is it being adopted? Uh, so I think the the reaction over Duet has been honestly great from our uh, customers and prospects. So we had tons of uh, interest and uh, conversation around Duet. So uh, Duet, of course, is still uh, it is a product that is uh, is evolving at a very fast uh, pace. So we went um, uh, GA last year in uh, in August with a, a first version of it that, um, but before that, actually we started as a test test program in March with uh, our, our, some of our customers to actually sort, sort of co-develop this with, with our, with our customers and prospects to, so getting their feedback. And uh, I think that this, this process really grounded into f feedback from customers uh, helped us having a good product from product from the get go. Uh, but, of course, the good thing is that the product is still evolving. So, for example, there is a new wave of features coming uh, in um, uh, soon. Let's say, but I better don't say when. Uh, they're coming very soon that everybody is extremely excited about. So, I would say there is a lot of interest in uh, in this uh, in this topic. And one thing that really surprised me is many customers arrived at the table already with their homeworks done. So. Uh, with a lot of interest internally, with a lot of ideas, many of them either even already built in a sort of AI console inside the company to understand how AI can actually um, help them in, in their in their mission. So I never seen that before with any other technology. So I'm very excited about it. So Duet specifically has been has been received very well. Um, of course, Duet is a tool that helps you do um, a lot of things out of the box. Uh, and there is, of course, always a little bit of space for actually a lot of space to for the last mile of customization and specialization uh, of your specific process. So Duet is always going to be a sort of uh, general purpose uh, AI that can help you with a lot of things. Now, then if you want something specific, very specific to your organization and maybe automated or uh, formalized with a pretty defined outcome, you might want to go the la uh, automate the last mile and have that last piece automated eventually with Vertex. So there are really a lot of uh, interesting moving parts that I think the whole market is still trying to figure out. Uh, so I don't think there is a, a final word on, on this right now, but the interest is definitely there. And the fact that we, as a partner, we offer a lot of different components uh, that definitely helps into being sure to be the right partner for our customer's journey in this in this direction. I think yeah. a big thing, thing for me, so it's part of my day-to-day -day job, we're, we're supporting customers doing pilots of Duet. And it's, I think one of the big points is in terms of Google's approach to AI, there, there's a strong ethical background and grounding in it. And, you know, we've seen a lot of generative AI solutions come out, but for our customers to have the knowledge that their data is safe, it's their data. It's not their data isn't going into um, other models. Um, I think is, you know, a, a big thing for us that you know Google have taken this approach to the way that they're using AI. 
I, you know, it may be the reason why, you know, Google are less um, rash. Uh, you know, you've got other solutions out there. Um, some horror stories of um, people's uh, data using these other services now part of the model. So you can start querying those models and finding their data is, is quite right. I, but one of the things, and I think this is where Duet works quite well with Bard being kind of the more consumer facing side of it is people can experiment with prompting. And I think that's one of the things when we're doing these pilots is educating people about with this, these large language models, how, how, how can you make them work? best for you. I, I I know there's quite a few people, experts in the room. I don't know if anyone's got their uh, prompt top tips that they want, want to share, which I think works really well as well. You start going into the development side of this as well. That that really turns into another show. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really do. I enjoy doing AI and I think that's a perfect uh, use case for it is, you know, practicing your prompts. And I kind of think of Duet as, you know, the, the built in function to sheets, whereas you can do so much with what's already there, but you might run into things that you need your custom function for. And that's when you can bring in things like Vertex AI and couple that with the workspace entry points to build something that really works specifically for you and your team. Very, very nice way to put it. I like it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, there's a ton of things we could talk about here, but I'd love to talk about are some of the use cases that folks have seen, right? Well, um, and they can be things you've built or things other people have built or things you're excited about. Uh, who wants to grab it first? Not throwing it up to anybody, but who? What, what's the most exciting thing you've seen somebody do with AI inside of Workspace so far? Actually, Alan, I was watching your DevFest talk from Montreal, and something that really excited me was the way that you were using two models to create an optimal experience for the user and the LLM to be able to give the best answer that it could possibly give. I would love to, you know, just touch on that for a minute if you... Sure. Um, I, I think one of the things that I like to do when trying to explain things to people is, is point out that these LLMs aren't sources of truth by themselves. What they're really good at, though, is kind of turning human ways of thinking of things into structured data, machine ways of thinking of things, things that programmers are really used to, and vice versa. So we might uh, take a human phrase and use the LLM to turn that into a data structure representing a query or representing the data that we want to query you know, about, you know, hit our databases about. And then we'll do that query. As programmers, we know how to do, you know, very normal stuff. Send this to a, as a database query. Send this to another API to, to get more information out, whatever. We're going to get another data structure back. And then we can send that data structure and the original question to another LLM and say, turn this into English. Turn this into something that will make sense to a real person. Um, and those two steps, we've always, you know, we, we've been able to do those sorts of things before, but never in as, as free form and as open and flexible a way as LLMs provide us. So we're not using the LLM to write poetry. We're not using the LLM to, you know, get answers. Um, and although, you know, having it write poetry is certainly a clever thing to do. Um, <laughs> But this is a way that we're using the LLMs to kind of understand, and I very much put that in quotes, uh, humans, and then help humans understand the data. Um, and that's, you know, that's what I do. Most of my work with LLMs is around those, those two elements. And you'll sometimes hear the industry refer to this broadly as retrieval augmented generation, or RAG. Um, and sometimes people kind of say RAG is a particular subcategory of that. But I, I feel like this is a, a prime way to use LLMs. So I just want to jump ahead a second. First of all, um, I agree with you. But we actually had one of our fellow GDs write a phenomenal solution on how do you actually not just write poetry, but also discover poems based upon the semantics of your prompts to help find content. I think it's a great example. So 
I'm going to put up a screen here in a second from uh, a bunch of community posts because I, I did ask about a bunch of different things. And um, if you check these links, and again, we'll put these in the comments as well, too. Um, there it goes. Um, we've got some great examples by folks in our community that have already built. We'll include these in the description below. But, but uh, Riel from Zaps actually put a really great solution out that did write poetry and then helps you discover <laughs> and find it. So, so check in the links there. There's a bunch of other great examples out there. While we have this up, does anybody else have kind of a, just the a favorite use case they want to discuss before we actually show you a few? Well, I'm going to call out my own one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do that. <laughs> yeah, so function calling. I So this is another example of how the community of kind of, you know, we, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. This was something that, uh, Romain, another GDE had done with chat GBD. Um, so Google launched Gemini uh, quite recently. And as part of that, a multimodal model able to do function calling. And I talked about this briefly on the last show. I think function calling within the context of Google Apps Script and Google Workspace is just a whole honeypot of really interesting stuff because when you're doing that, you're essentially exposing what functions you've got within your app script code to the LLM. And if the LLM detects that it should be running one of your functions, it'll, it'll, it'll do that. Um, so you're not running the function within the LLM, you're running it in app script. So there's a whole identity piece there, which I think is incredibly powerful. Um, and so based on Romain's original chat GPT, library, I created the Gemini library, and um, I'm going to have a lot more fun with that, I think, in the coming weeks. I'm well, very excited about that. So I have, a lot of, I have a lot of favorite ones, and I'm not going to bring them here. What I want to do is throw it up to Mohammed. I tried to do a little show and tell, and I think we need a little more show than tell. <laughs> Mohammed, you built a great sample, and why don't you share us quickly a demo of what it was and talk a little bit about what you built. Sure thing, thanks. So what I try to do is really experiment with the Google um, add-on, you know, Workspace add-on framework to build a drive add-on that allows me to just do basic summarization. Um, so I use our framework, which uses the cards UI um, for, you know, easy UI um, design. Uh, basically, it's an add-on that you can install. Um, you can see that you can open it here from the sidebar. It will prompt you to select a file. Uh, I've created this Canadian National Park, some based in Canada. I asked Bard actually to generate um, a list of some Canadian national parks with some details and data. And I saved that as a sheets uh, file. And then once I click on it, I get an option of selecting uh, what kind of summary do I want. So in this case, let's say we want something that's medium sized and I want it to be in bullet points format. And I'm gonna use the Gemini Pro model Click on generate. Now what's happening in the background is the add-on framework is sending the file ID back to my code, which lives on Google Cloud. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And then that code goes and executes um, an LLM prompt uh, using Gemini Pro, gets the data back. It's formatted in Markdown. Uh, we've built a converter to turn that into nice decorated text widgets. Uh, that shows up in our add-on. And there you go, you can see the summary. Now, the, the beauty of this is because you're running this in the context of Drive, everything, there is no issues with authentication. You get tokens to be able to call the Google Workspace APIs on behalf of the users. Uh, you can export things to Docs, for example. If I click on this, then the generated text will go into um, an AI summary that's created there. And you can support any drive files. So you can do the same with docs, you can do this with slides, and even you can do it with a uh, meeting transcript. So really the beauty of this integrated experience is experimenting with how do I connect workspace users with Vertex AI or really any third party APIs. So this was one of the integrations. Now the other integration using the same add-on framework because it allows you to build one add-on that executes or is enabled for multiple products. I've extended this to uh, be able to generate, you know, smart replies for Gmail. So this is another demo. As you see, the first time that I've opened this email, uh, this demo email account, I get an email sent from Gmail saying like, welcome. 
And in a similar manner, if I open my um, Genii Companion, that's what I call it, uh, it will show me a different screen specific to Gmail, uh, gets all the metadata for the email and ask me what I want to say. In this case, I'm just going to say like generate something that says thank you with emojis. This is actually something really interesting. Um, you know, do this with a fun tone and then uh, English is fine using Gemini Pro again and click generate reply. And hopefully I will get a funny answer that goes with using emojis, etc. I can click on use this reply to call the Gmail APIs to actually answer this within the same email. So really the beauty of this is I was just trying to experiment. How do I bring AI to workspace using what we have today? And this is what we have. Now everything is open source, so um, I think we can share the link, um, but you can look at how this was built using Node.js and uh, Gemini, and uh, you can switch providers, et cetera. Um, I thought it's, it's a nice hacky way of, you know, just experimenting with stuff. We did, um, internally, we did a similar Gmail one. We called it Palm Pilot. <laughs> <laughs> that I brings think memories. We may, have, may, have, may have lost most of our younger audience with that one. I, I recall, I recall. <laughs> well, like, have you heard of this hot new thing called a Palm Pilot? <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I obviously yeah, can trade the mark the, the demo name, but there we go. <laughs> so uh, real quick, uh, Donato, I know you have an example too that you were working on, which I've seen a sneak preview and it's pretty phenomenal. Would you mind sharing that as well too? Sure thing. Give me just a second. I'm going to share my screen. Add you. So just while that's happening, Mohammed, just to recap, so basically, you know, you're using the the card service to, and you've got that real estate. You've also got, uh, in terms of the sidebar, but you've got the context of what you're looking at. So for example, the, the Gmail one, you've got the context of the message. So you can pull that message in, you can do what you want in terms of prompting and get a response and then just render that back. Exactly. I mean, the, the beauty of this mm -hmm. specific example is I also wanted to experiment with alternative runtimes. So as you know, you know, you can use App Script to build an add-on, but you can also use your own stack. In this case, I wanted something mm -hmm. that would scale, that will show how anybody can use their own runtime, in this case, Node.js, to host, to host an HTTPS endpoint that can interact with cards and the add-on framework and all of that. And I, I think the possibilities, I mean, it seems simple, like it's just summarizing, it's just like a quick email reply and um, but this is just the beginning. Like you can build any use case that you want using workspace data and integration. And things becomes much more exciting with multimodal models. So I know with Gemini, for example, one of our colleagues, you know, our manager actually, you know, was experimenting with using slides add-on to send a, an image of slide and say like, you know, assess the slide. Is it good? Is it bad? What do I need to do it? As an image and text. So like, I think this is the next thing I'm gonna quote unquote borrow and, and add to this sample. Uh, but yeah, you can see that it's up to your imagination. You know, you, I just wanted to show that the um, integration is possible. These are the Lego pieces, and now you go and do your own thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Donato, what did you build? Yeah, uh, so I I sort of um, played a little bit with the ideas of how can AI help me with uh, automating some of the activities that we do directly uh, in the place where I work. So in this case, Typically, always try to uh, to concentrate on scenarios. So, uh, so I imagine a scenario where you know you are on PTO for a few for a few days or a few weeks, and you come back and you have you know your your mailbox with uh, a, a lot of unread emails, and you need to start uh, you need to start to uh, catch up on things to do and uh, prioritize activities. So one of the things I imagine is uh, one, because I, I would have loved to have that uh, in my previous job was, uh, so I need to prioritize. So where do I start from? I typically start from uh, the emails where I have a customer is upset or where I have somebody that is, uh, you know, is, is angry of some sort. So what I've done is as first, I created a sort of an add-on for Gmail that would use um, AI to identify angry customers. So I 
run a quick quick sentiment analysis of my unread emails to identify those where there is an upset tone and uh, this will would label that those for me so i know for example i need to start i need to start from those and in this case i'm just labeling them but of course this could be um, uh, the funnel for a workflow, or I can escalate those, or I can do anything I want with those once I identify them. So in this case, let's say I, I open one of these emails and I find that I received an escalation from a customer. So I have a customer uh, who is upset with me uh, for something. So something's going wrong, uh, we need to act. And uh, as typically happens in these escalations, they might not give you all the details required for you to actually understand what's going on. So if you receive something like that, typically your next step will be to, um, well, you know, take note of the customer and the domain that you will go on Jira or on your trouble ticketing system of choice. And you will like, will like spend the next couple of hours just digging into all the open tickets with this customer. Uh, all the back and forth uh, in the comments to understand what what was the issue, what went wrong, why is the customer still upset. So uh, you need to do all these legworks to uh, understand what the customer, uh, what the problem is, and to help the customer fixing it. So uh, once you receive an email like that, so basically your next your afternoon is gone, right? So uh, generative AI can actually help you with that. So I created this add-on uh, that. Um, pops up in the, con in the context of the email you have in, of course, can easily take the, um, let's say, the sender into consideration. And if I click on this button, so it's connecting with Jira and it's extracting all the tickets open for this customer based on the sender and it's giving me a summary of the situation. So uh, I can quickly have a, a, a good overview of what is happening. So for example, now I know quickly there are two tickets open and one thing seems to go to be going well but for another one, there is something that is not working. Um, so the generative AI, I prepared some specific prompts in the back end, automated, that would extract everything and would give me a summary of the ticket so I can understand what, what the problem is. And then if there is frustration in the conversation, I ask, okay, tell me why there is frustration. What's the reason of frustration? And I have immediately here a good understanding of what's the problem. And then also, I try to rank it based on uh, the level of frustration here to understand how we are entering the ticket. So this is not based on if the ticket is open or closed, but it's mainly meant, uh, based on is the customer upset? Because if the customer is upset, you know, perception is reality. We are doing something wrong. So uh, and then if I want to answer to the customer, I can click this button here. This is going to create an answer for my customer that it's not generic, but it's based on the specific ticket. And it's written in a, uh, in a professional, but also a little bit apologetic way because there is definitely something, some, something wrong. So I fine tune the tone of that email uh, to be uh, in tune with what I would answer um, based on what the problem is. So I can have a quick explanation of the situation and what we're doing to fix it. So again, this is an example of things that you can build uh, to really bring your specific process into life. And the good thing is that the add-on framework is fantastic because you, in this case, I connected to Jira, but you can you know, replace that with anything that offers APIs. Um, and you can see how you can bring into your place of work data and information coming from third-party sources. And you can use Vertex on generative AI in general to summarize that for you. This is fascinating. I'm I'm blown away by this, and it's funny because while you were talking, I was like, "Oh wow, it'd be really cool if you could like, you know, build an email based on all this context that you've created." And then you just clicked the email, and there it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. There, there is really just right now a. Uh, Imagination is probably the biggest limit of understanding what you can build. The moment you can imagine it, very likely you can build it with AI right now. And honestly, I built this in one afternoon. So it's super easy and fast to build these sort of solutions. Uh, that's the real game changer. Maybe I could have done something like that in the past, but it would have taken me way longer because I, I would have needed to build eventually a dedicated ML model to understand all that, train that. So. Uh, Generative AI reduced drastically the time required to build these sort of things. I, I think as well, there's the for me the the, the price point. It's 
you know, it's it's really low. Um, I think Google could be charging a lot more for this. <laughs> um edit that out <laughs> yeah yeah uh, <laughs> we're talking well you can find um the you know things for gemini you can see that in, indicate pricing for that but we're talking for you know a thousand characters a fraction of one cent um so uh that's my feedback to you guys at google you can you can be billing more for this. <laughs> You're some opportunities. You're now you can... canceled, Martin. <laughs> actually, actually, a great segue. Alan, why we have you here is we're coming up on the time already. That went super fast. Um, tell us, tell us a little bit more about you know, kind of building some of these models or optimizing some of these models. You know, tell us things like you know, about Langchain, for example. Like, what? How do you prepare the models to be ready for these use cases? Well. And I think that's kind of it is you're not building the models, you're not training the models, you're not, you know, you're you're using the models. And I think that's kind of the neat thing about where we are with uh, with these models right now is um, we do have tools like Langchain or Langchain JS, which are uh, open source libraries that are out there for, for Python and JavaScript. And there are similar libraries for a bunch of other languages that start to treat uh, these models and many other tools that work well with them, as as you said before, as Lego blocks. So we can take a model and plug it into a tool that does an SQL query, or take a model and plug it into something that will index our documents in a way that we can do semantic searches, and feed those results into another model to do something else, and um, chain them with with things that can make decisions based on the results of the outputs of one model, maybe do a different query one way or another. So we have almost intelligent agents. And we can start using tools like Langchain and Langchain.js to build these up um, and do a whole bunch of stuff behind the scenes. So many of this has already been done for us. There's, again, there's some development. There's sticking the Legos together, uh, but a lot of it's already done. And uh, you know, we mentioned before uh, things like Dialogflow. Um, and Dialogflow is doing many of the same things. So whereas before we needed to define all of the intents, all of the phrases that we were expecting, now Dialogflow is saying, don't worry about that. Just load in all your documents. And if the user asks a question that we can answer with the documents, we will. And if you've got some specific phrases or some specific paths that you want them to take, you can build those. And if not, plug into a generative AI and give it some guidance, and we'll come up with a reasonable response. And then since it's dialogue flow, that means you can plug it into things like um, uh, Google Chat or any other front end that you build. So, so we're assembling all of these pieces that we can put together. And I think that's really kind of what excites me right now is seeing what all of the developers are doing in taking individual pieces and plugging them together in ways that we didn't think of before. And that's like, that's a perfect thing that Workspace lets us do. It's, it's a great platform for letting us do those sorts of things. So I have, a, I have a couple of questions. I know we're almost at time, but I have a couple of questions, and I think it would it would be unfair if we didn't ask about some of the pitfalls or obstacles or challenges. You guys talk about this is easy. I can do it fast. It's an extension. You showed demos great. They were they're creative. But what about things like data privacy? What about things like making sure that the content is used appropriately? Uh, what about making sure that your features are actually customizable and aren't going to be features that may pop in? And, you know, native to the product or something. How, as a developer, do you navigate making sure your solution is viable, secure, private, hits the mark, but doesn't hit any of those obstacles? Well, I, I mean, I think the first step is that realizing that Google is doing some of that for us already. You know, if you're using Google Cloud, uh, your conversations, your data is yours. It's attached to your project. It doesn't go outside of your project. Um, there are there are certainly models that Google makes available that that you know that that Google says, look, if you're using this, we may use your training data, 
So you need to be careful. You need to read exactly what the terms are. But the good news is if you're using Google Cloud Vertex AI, it's your data. Um, you need to see if you're using third parties and where you're sharing it with third parties and what those third parties terms of use are. How are they using the data? But I would hope that, that we as developers are looking at those questions no matter what third party we're using. You know, some of it is these are these are issues and questions we've always had to deal with. Um, and finally, one of the things that, that I like to say is, you know, we always talk about how content is king. It's, it's really the most valuable stuff that we have. But context is queen. Being able to say that, you know, this user has asked for these things in the past, that's context that, we, that, that can, we can put into our queries. But that means we need to protect that data. Knowing that this user is in a particular time zone means that we know what time it is. So when they ask questions like, you know, when is this going to happen? We can return a contextually relevant answer because we fed that context into the prompt. So the LLM is giving a contextually relevant answer. That's great, but we need to store that time zone information. We need to store the user's first name. We need to store all of that in a safe and secure way. And fortunately, Google provides some of those tools, but we need to know how to use them correctly. That's awesome. And, and I also want to add as a last thing that we are probably, I mean, we are definitely the only hyperscaler who has their own uh, model. So we are the only hyperscaler company who owns their LLM. So there is a lot of talking about, you know, responsible AI. I'm not sure how can you really enforce any responsible policy on an LLM model that you don't own. So we are the only one who has it. So we're, we always have done a, make a, made a big deal about it. So we definitely are on the forefront of that. And the Duet AI definitely, and Duet AI and Vertex AI definitely have that built in. So when we say your data is your data is your data, it, it's really it's really uh, the main key of what we're trying to to pass here. There was, it was never an accident uh, about data served into a, a Google ML uh, system that surface somewhere else because it simply cannot be because we don't use that to improve our model. So your data is your data. Your data is your data. Hamid, do you have anything to add from a third party perspective? Yeah, I think, I mean, as, as developers, uh, we, we think of how to use responsible AI. And, you know, we're reading about all the terms of service, terms of use, and privacy policy of the service we use. But I think we should give the same courtesy to our users. So as developers, you should be transparent with how you use the data that you collect and respecting the tasks, uh, the terms of service for, like, workspace and uh, posting and creating uh, transparent privacy policies, because when you publish, for example, on the Google Workspace uh, Marketplace, you will be asked to publish that. So um, I think that's one thing for us to remember as developers is to be responsible towards our users the same way that we want, you know, third party vendors and APIs to be responsible. Okay, my last question, I promise. We, <laughs> uh, we've covered a lot. There's a lot of exciting things here. Uh, you, you made me feel like it was easy. Um, how do developers keep up with all this? It's coming out as fast. And I'm seeing great demos every day. Alan, you're already laughing. There's probably no answer. Um, but what would you recommend? What would you advise? And yeah, I know we need another show on this, but how do you keep up with all this stuff coming at you? I mean, in as much as I do, and I'm so sure that I do, it's, <laughs> it's finding those networks of people on LinkedIn. It's you know seeing the the monthly summaries that are coming out of the uh, the ML GDE program and seeing what all of the other GDEs are are doing in this space and just trying to wrap my head around it. Um, it's seeing those examples like that. It's how, you know it's it's building that network of other people who are exploring it at the same time you are. So when when one of us says, hey, I just discovered this, or I'm playing with this model. Uh, we can talk about it. It's, it's being part of the, uh, the Google developer communities and wherever they are, and there are plenty of them. Um, and just talking to others and seeing what we're all encountering and solving the problems together. This is without a doubt one of the biggest community projects that I've seen for in a long time. It's almost like the entire 
uh, developer community is all saying, this is a new tool and we all need to learn it and we're all helping each other. I, I just underline that. I think it's really amazing in terms of what people are sharing as part of this journey. Um, you know, there've been times I've been slightly hesitant in terms of pushing the publish button, um, but I've gone, ah, the hell with it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'd uh, echo Alan. I think um, if you see a DevFest event near you online, I think they're great hotspots in terms of currently, you know, a lot of those events are getting so many different perspectives on this technology and, you know, things like LandChain, I learned at DevFest, things like Di Dialogflow, I learned at DevFest or other kind of developer events. So. Um, keeping your eyes and ears open, I think, is um, one of those things that will serve to benefit you in the future. Absolutely. A anybody else? Yeah, yeah, I would also add, uh, I mean, for now, we've been covering how you stay updated on the technical side. But I want to say also, uh, stay updated on the problem side of the, of the thing. So keep talking, talk about problems, ask companies, customers, partners, colleagues, what what are their problems? So what what, what are the things that actually um, could make their job uh, their job better? What what they would do if they would have a magic wand? So I think that that's that part of the thing hasn't changed. You, if you stay attached to the real problems, now you can you have a no, uh, a whole new set of tools and toys you can use to fix the problem, and you can do it in way better ways than before. So I think. If you keep talking and keep listening, what are the problems that the, the people have in real life? That will give you a lot of inspirations about good use cases, rather than just look at that from the technical side. We, I mean, I'm I'm, a, I'm an engineer. From a, I always have, you know, uh, my personal scene is always like looking everything from the technology point of view, right? I have a cool thing. How can I use it? Uh, which is great. But I try to force myself uh, often to try to do the other thing. So, what's the problem? And then what's the best technology to solve that? And now AI could be on top of that list for many of the problems that are around. Awesome. With that, I, I did promise no more questions. And then this one's not for me, but one of the things we love here on Code the Unscript is we get really great feedback. And thank you for that for folks who are watching this live. We also got great questions. And, and Kara, I hate to do this, but I'm going to. We got a great question from, from uh, Bikram. And I'd love to share that. And, I, and I'm sharing this more as a ask, um, but we've had a lot of folks ask, what is the convergence of AppScript and Duet AI? And I know there's not an answer you can share with us at this moment, but I love the fact that folks are thinking about this. Do you have any thoughts since you work closely with the team? Um, well, yeah, I mean, to your point, there's not a lot we can say, but I, I we do get this question all the time. And especially Charles, you and I, every event that we've spoken at since AI started on the scene. <laughs> this is a question that comes up in some form. Um, and I know that AI is top of mind for the AppScript team and how how we can incorporate um, the, the capabilities with AppScript. And so I'm excited as well as Bigram to see how this pans out. Hopefully, yes, you know I agree. <laughs> Here's my prediction. You won't need the script editor. Ooh, you and, on that, and on that, and on that, very interesting, Martin. Very interesting. You'll write the script for you. <laughs> on that, and I then think... you'll tweak it. Macros on steroids. That's, anyway. a, that's a brave prediction. Um, with that said, anybody want a final thought before we say goodbye? I think we're good. Want... And we've, we've we've broken the the promise. We've definitely gone over yeah, forty five. Yeah, good one, yeah, worth it. Uh, so, <laughs> Why so good. You can't expect with this many people that we <laughs> stay within the time. <laughs> <laughs> we will be back. You can't stop us. Um, so we may <laughs> even just reunite this entire panel and just talk for 50 minutes. This more, is so. an amazing mm -hmm. panel. Yeah, thank you guys so much. This has been great. Thank, thank you, you so much for having us. Well, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for the questions. If you're watching this on the recording, throw some in the description below. Love ideas for not just this episode or future episodes, but again, please join us on an episode. With that, Martin, take us out. Happy scripting. Bye.